I'm Ron Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. I was born back in the East Coast, Boston, Massachusetts, spent a few years in Vermont, uh, got used to the cold weather, so that's why I like to walk around with uh, t-shirts and shorts even when it's uh, 40 degrees out here and everybody's freezing. But I grew up in Pacific Beach as a teenager and then moved to the East County in the early 70s. I uh, started a home inspection business with a partner in 1988 after finishing up an insurance career with American General Insurance. Uh, so I've been doing that for 22 years and I've been running for Congress since uh, the year 2000. So this is my seventh go around. My platform is basically the same as Dr. Ron Paul's platform. It's the Constitution. And, and people talk about the Constitution from different parties and from different persuasions and they, they think that they're going with the Constitution. But if you don't understand that our Constitution was created by the state governments for the purpose of having a federal government with limited powers. And those limited powers are defined in section, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 through 18 of the Constitution. And they deal with issues that are foreign to the states, not domestic issues. When Madison referred to uh, the document and they're trying to pass it, he made it clear in Federalist Paper 45 that the federal government was to deal with issues that would be dealing with foreign nations, issues of disputes between the states, and everything to deal with your life, your liberty, and your property was reserved for the states respectively. Today, we engaged in a system that is the opposite of that. We have a federal government that consumes all of our production. It's a $3.8 trillion federal budget. It's one and a half trillion dollars short of what it's supposed to do uh, to balance the budget. So the revenues are short, 1.5 trillion. And uh, we're all being taxed to death and we're going bankrupt as the federal government. People are worried about the federal government going bankrupt. They won't. It's a society that's coming apart now. And it's because we've forgotten the Constitution. We don't follow by the, by the rules. All the issues to deal with life, liberty, and property belong with the states, the counties, and the city governments. And so this is why we're off track, and I'm looking forward to getting your questions to handle, talk about all the things the federal government should not be doing and what the federal government should be doing. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, No Child Left Behind is a federal program that should be should have never happened in the first place. It's uh, part of the uh, Federal Department of Education that was created in 1979 with uh, Washington bureaucrats who thought they knew best for us here locally. And uh, the 60 to 80 trillion, uh, 80 billion dollars a year that they spend with this department could easily be cut out. This money is used as strings uh, to control education in the states here. I got a personal example with my daughter. Uh, they wanted to keep her after school for Title, uh, title 11, I think, or Title I uh, program, part of the uh, Federal Department of Education, to help learn, teach her to read because she wasn't doing that well. And there, so there's also incentive not to reach a certain level so you can get them additional money. So I said, no, I'm having nothing to do with that. And so I sat down, and I know it's a parent's job to teach their kids, but I sat down and taught her how to read, and taught her phonics, and taught her all of that. Uh, so these programs, they don't work. Education works best the closer it gets to the parent. If the parent can fire the teacher and choose the teacher or the school, then education works. Yeah, welfare programs. The federal government has no constitutional authority to be engaged in uh, any kind of welfare program. So my <coughs> druthers would be that all of this is devolved down, back down to the states, back down to the counties, and back down to the churches, and back down to you. When your neighbor's hungry, you give them a sandwich, and you help them out to help them get back on his feet again. Uh, when the federal government is overseeing any of these things, the further away it gets from you, 
the worse it gets. And that's just the way it is, and they have an industry. They go around looking for clients at the federal government level to put people on welfare programs, no incentive to get off of them. So it actually works best when there's some, I'll help you get on your feet, but you're going to have to do something about it too. And so that's the way I would approach it. Federal level, no, no, no minimum wage. Now, and there's a federal minimum wage law that applies to all the states, so it's not true that one state doesn't have it. Now, if the states decided to have a minimum wage law, I would only like that for one reason, and that reason would be we could see what really works. And these minimum wage laws don't work, okay? All they do is drive the price of the goods and services up that we buy. If you come in and the minimum wage is $8 an hour, and so they raise it to nine, the person that's been there while making nine has to make 10. And the person above that was making 10 has to make 11. And then you get this, you know, chasing for higher wages and you get inflation. In 1964, a silver dollar, if I got paid one, do one silver dollar for an hour's work, that's a good deal. One silver dollar, 1964. Today, that silver dollar is $30, 30 Federal Reserve notes. So when the government says, here, we'll give you a benefit, we're gonna raise your minimum wage up, and they're out there spending money everywhere else, and they're printing money, and putting it into the, out of the, from the printing press into the system, it devalues the price or the value of that dollar that you're earning. It makes it worth less, it buys less. So on one hand, they say, oh, I'll give you more money, but then you end up buying less. It's not how much money you make that's important. It's what you can buy with the money that you do make. <laughs> and the reason we're in a mess today is because we don't adhere to the Constitution in a lot of ways, in a lot of areas. Now, these programs, if you want the state, nothing in the Constitution prohibits the state from having these programs. And if you understand that the states are basically independent countries. We had 13 independent countries form the federal government. They came together, they were independent states. That's the term used in the Declaration of Independence. They are not prohibited from doing any of these programs for the benefit of the people. In fact, Madison made it clear that all those sorts of powers were resolved to be with the states. The state was to retain the power to deal with everything that happened to do with a person's life, liberty, and property. So uh, absolutely not. If you want the federal government to do it, then give us a process. It was called the uh, constitutional amendment process. And, and then you get the federal government to do that. Now, what does that mean? That you chop them off right now? You can't do that. People are dependent on these programs. You gotta give them an opportunity to work their way out of them. And uh, give the young people an opportunity to get out of the Social Security because I'm 60, uh, 61 in a few months. I don't think the early retirement's gonna be there for me at 62 coming out of Social Security. That's how concerned I am with it even existing. You can't run a federal government with $1.5 trillion out of whack and expect your Social Security to still be there. If they have to use the printing press money to make this happen, it will buy half as much. It's the same problem we talked, I mentioned about the minimum wage. You get your Social Security check and it goes to, you go to the grocery store and the can of peaches is $5 instead of what it was a few years ago, less than a dollar. So. Okay. You know, typically it's been, what are you going to do for us? What are you going to bring back to the district? And the problem is they bring back some of the booty that they've stolen from other areas of the country. And, and that doesn't work. Now we're, we're suffering the consequences of this. Instead of bringing something back, how about stop taking? Stop taking your tax money to Washington to put it in an endless pit. And, stop, and, and you know, I say, and you talk about deregulation. Some people say don't do anything about the minimum wage. But you know what? And then the laws about no child labor anymore. 
I'm, I'm not happy about those laws. I was a kid, I worked, and there was no minimum wage. And the, the lady uh, that I pulled weeds for would pay me for that. And these are jobs. Now, now that we have illegals doing these, and a lot of the reason is the kids aren't there looking for the work anymore. So people have an illegal alien doing their gardening for them. Not making excuses, but here's some of the things that we may go wrong. If we're spending almost up to a trillion dollars a year in a foreign policy, that's money that's leaving this economy. And so how long, or do, now the Federal Reserve, what they do is a TARP program, they give it to the Wall Street people. Some people might say, well, how about a TARP program for us? Well, no, because it doesn't work. It's putting, it's putting water into the soup. You don't get more soup out of that. Right now, we don't have enough soup. We don't have enough jobs. Things aren't moving, right? Well, they, they tried to do that a little bit by saying, let's lower uh, the amount of Social Security that was coming out of uh, people's wages so they'd have more money to spend. Well, that's, let's find another way to pay for Social Security, like maybe selling off federal land. Arizona is 75% owned by the federal government and let these things pay for Social Security. Let people keep the fruits of their labor and they'll start spending it into the economy and the economy will work. Government is an anchor to the economy. It doesn't help it. It hurts it. It's a cost to the economy. A necessary cost when it defends our liberty. And a totally unnecessary evil cost when it robs us of our sustenance. And that's what it's doing. Connie. Uh, you see, government's the problem, not the solution. And until we realize that, we're going to keep going where we're going. We'll all go bankrupt. All businesses will go bankrupt. We'll lose all our property. And guess who will assume it? The federal government will assume it all and then rent it back to us. You know, this idea that the government should be spending more money, they're spending a trillion and a half more than they should be right now. And they're printing money to cover that. They're printing it up. So when you do that, everything that we buy goes up in price. We have less money to spend on other things. That kills the economy. If you have to pay more for all your groceries, then you can't go out to the restaurant as often. The restaurant has less business. They can't afford to do whatever they need to do. And onward and onward this thing goes. So the answer is to get the government out, not more involved. And then we will flourish. That's what made America great, is a small government that protected our right to life, liberty, and prosperity. Yeah, there's a, this is a complicated subject. It deals with the law. And so people uh, on both sides of the issue can really believe that they have a legal argument that sustains their position. And this is what you have with the law all the time. You have it go, uh, the Supreme Court decides the law sometimes five to four. And so people of good intention will say, no, American citizens are, you know, not in jeopardy on this, da 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 because of the way they're interpreting it. And then other people, the knowledgeable people, interpret it the other way. Now, how it works in the real world is that if you're picked up and as an American citizen and detained without a right of trial, uh, without any habeas corpus, then uh, you could be sitting there while you got attorneys arguing about this for several years, and you're an American citizen. Now, I don't agree with Diane Feinstein on many things, but she offered a simple amendment to this to solve this issue. And the arrogance of these people in power, including the, a rather new congressman, Duncan Hunter, to, to just arrogantly not just assume that their position is right and they're going to cram it down us, she offered this simple amendment. The authority described in this section for the armed forces of the United States to detain a person does not include the authority to detain a U.S. citizen or a citizen of the United States without trial till the end of hostilities. That's simple. It'll give more, more leeway there. They'd say, you're a U.S. citizen. We can't throw you away, lock, uh, throw, put you in jail and throw the key away uh, and no right to get before a judge. 
because you're a U.S. citizen and you're protected under the Constitution. That's simple. And these guys are too arrogant to look at the bill and place that in there. And then some of them are actually evil and think that it's in our best interest to pull yeah. uh, citizens and put them in jail. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got time. General Welfare Clause of the Constitution uh, refers to why they are laying out 18 limited powers for the federal government. Mm -hmm. They're to promote the general welfare and this is how we're going to do it. It doesn't mean that these limits on the federal government can be overturned if you do something under the guise of the general welfare. So if you're going to respect the Constitution, you have to respect the limits of power on the federal government and the powers and rights reserved to the people. That was a formula that led America to be the most prosperous nation on earth.